We're living in perplexing and uncertain times. Our world faces extraordinary challenges, a global pandemic, an accelerating infodemic, nuclear threats, a deluge of misinformation, massive digital transformation, and of course, monumental climate change. The way in which we manage these interconnected and compounding threats, they've got monumental implications for the future of humanity. More than at any other time in history, the decisions we take now will influence future generations in extraordinarily profound ways. One tool we have to make us smarter or wiser decisions is maps. They can help provide perspective. Even if we feel uneasy about the future, maps can inspire optimism and action. They do this by helping identify dangers ahead, while also revealing our remarkable advances over the last couple of centuries. At a time when all of us feel inundated with data, maps help cut through the noise and offer deeper insight into our transforming world. They can help explain a vast range of insights in an instant, from health to our happiness. And it turns out we're hardwired for maps. The visual stimulus appeals directly to our enlarged cerebral cortex, which controls functions, including sight, speech, thought, and memory. And it's their capacity to render complex dynamics in an easy and intuitive way that makes some maps just so appealing. There really is science behind the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. Yet maps aren't static or fixed. They need periodic updating. As Albert Einstein reminded us, you can't use old maps to explore a new world. So map making is an ancient impulse. For thousands of years, we've been scribbling down the nearest water or food source on cave walls, boulders, and parchment. These early maps, they helped us locate ourselves and make sense of the world and universe around us. The oldest known map, Imago Mundi, was drafted more than 2,500 years ago in Babylon, in present-day Iraq. An even more influential global map was Geographia, produced by the Greek astronomer, geographer, and mathematician Ptolemy in 150 AD. Now, maps have evolved considerably since then, from these flat and uncharted masses demarcated with dragons and strange and terrifying beasts. By chronicling our surroundings, maps over time have enabled civilizations to generate new connections, innovations, and inventions that literally transformed the game. And today we have an incredible array of maps that can help us better understand our human and ecological condition. We have macroscopic maps, satellites and telescopes, which are charting our cosmos and our Earth. And we've got microscopic maps with electron microscopes, which are tracking the genetic composition of viruses across time and space. With the click of a button, we can access digital maps that fan out from the cellular to the celestial scale, often in real time. It's this diversity that helps give perspective and ultimately the data and evidence to make better decisions. Now I've spent the last decade building out data visualizations and analytics to power new understanding for governments, for companies and for nonprofits and international organizations. I've designed dozens of tools to track indicators of urban fragility and resilience across more than 2000 cities. I've worked with epidemiologists, criminologists and climatologists to map and track health, safety, environmental and digital hotspots in some of the world's biggest cities. And what I've learned is the power and potential of these kinds of remote sensing and high resolution platforms to drive better decisions, big and small. Our global reliance on maps is more evident than ever. Just take the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of us around the world have been glued to a darkly mesmerizing map of COVID-19 since early 2020. We've all watched as the virus spread to over 200 countries infecting more than 200 million people and killing well over 4 million. Maps of infections, fatalities, and vaccinations, they reveal how countries and cities are coping and how they're not. On the one hand, they highlight the incredible progress we've made. You know, scientists have sequenced the coronavirus genome thousands of times over the last year and provided over 5 billion vaccination doses in under a year. On the other, they reveal serious pitfalls, such as the fact that just two countries have used over 50% of all vaccines, and 95 others have yet to administer a single dose. The costs of our uneven response to the pandemic, they're cumulative. The contraction of global air travel, the fragmentation of supply chains, the disruption to productivity, it's hitting some countries and societies harder than others. Governments that are able to provide stimulus and safely reopen their economies, they're doing better than those that can. Countries with strong and diversified and integrated economies, they're rebounding faster, as opposed to those that rely on a single sector, say tourism. 
Overall, the pandemic is going to set back middle income countries by a generation or more. These kinds of setbacks, especially amongst the 60% of the world working in the informal sector, it's going to deepen grievances and mistrust of governments, fueling nationalism and possibly social unrest. Now, other types of viruses that maps can help reveal, they're digital in nature. Maps remind us how the internet, it's the world's nervous system. Today, the digital economy makes up over 25% of global GDP. And it's stitched together by just 420 submarine cables, 2,600 operational satellites, and 30, over 30 million cell towers and data centers. Now, those of us who are connected, we're gonna benefit. Those of us who are not, we risk being left behind, especially as the world transitions to remote services and work. Maps remind us that digital divides, they're shrinking between and within countries overall, but they also reveal how large parts of the world are still digitally disconnected. In wealthy countries, over 80% of the population has access to the internet, compared to just 43% in poor nations. These kinds of gaps, they're especially pronounced in Africa, in South and Southeast Asia. More than ever, the mantra for all of us is go digital or go dark. One area where maps are reshaping global awareness and action in extraordinary ways is in relation to climate change and global warming. The frequency and intensity of fires, floods, droughts, and the rest due to human causes, they're increasingly impossible to ignore. From the Americas and Europe to Africa and Asia, record-breaking heat waves, they're creating tinderbox conditions. Already about a third of the world's population is exposed to deadly heat for 20 days or more every year. In India, two thirds of the population was exposed to heat waves last year. And if greenhouse gas emissions, if they're not dramatically reduced, extreme heat waves could threaten three quarters of the global population before the end of this century. NASA, NOAA, the European Space Agency and private companies like Esri and Planet, they're mapping these patterns from above. The impacts of extreme weather events on people and our planet, they're the stuff of nightmares. Now, as bad as the current situation is, we can expect far worse in the future. The latest IPCC report says that we're gonna almost certainly sail past the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold that we set within the next 20 years. And this comes after we just experienced the hottest decade in recorded history. The expectation is that continued greenhouse gas emissions, they're gonna send temperatures soaring further still. Pollution, it already kills almost 9 million people a year, far more than wars or homicide and terrorism combined. But soaring heat islands, intensifying rainfall, melting ice caps and changing ocean currents, they're gonna to make today's trials look gentle by comparison. Global warming isn't just heating up land, it's also heating up the world's oceans and seas and waterways. The world's oceans are dramatically warming and becoming less oxygen risk, threatening delicate marine ecosystems and the coastal communities that depend on them. An astonishing 200 species are disappearing every day, and millions more are threatened with extinction if temperatures keep rising. We can actually anticipate where the tipping points are likely to occur using maps, which makes inaction inexcusable. The only way we're going to stall and eventually reverse global warming is a radical transition to a zero carbon world. The science is clear. Right now, CO2 and methane levels are at higher points than at almost any time in the last 1 million years. A wholesale shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy is crucial, but so is achieving zero deforestation, building more sustainable cities, and eating less meat. Now, despite this gloomy forecast, there is potentially a green horizon. It looks like we might actually be reaching a climate action tipping point. And there are signs of change everywhere in the air. Climate activist groups made up of young people from Fridays for Future to the Extinction Rebellion they're demanding change and taking polluters to court. Activist investors are forcing some of the world's largest oil and gas companies to adopt greener strategies. And investors with assets of tens of trillions are calling on G7 and G20 countries to implement and deliver on the Paris Climate Agreement. The good news is we know what needs to be done and we have the means to achieve change. It's gonna require leveraging technological innovations, capitalizing on falling renewable energy, expanding carbon markets, investing in carbon sequestration, and incentivizing a shift to greener economies. The question is not whether we need to move, it's how fast can we move. Much hinges on how the G20, and in particular the US and China, manage their relationship and engage in financing climate action. 
Overall, just 20 countries account for 80% of global greenhouse gases. A mere 100 companies, most of them in the oil and gas sector, account for 70% of all emissions, underlying the profound injustices and inequities of the climate challenge. But most of the countries around the world, they're taking their cue from the US and China relationship. Maps remind us that despite the enormous trials ahead, we've actually made extraordinary progress in a very short period of time. We see gains across virtually all domains of human endeavor, from education and health to overall prosperity and well being. For all its limitations, globalization has been one of the most progressive forces for positive change in human history. Despite its many negative externalities and the spread of global bads, it's ushered in unbelievable change. And one of its most important legacies is the prolongation of life itself. Think about it. For virtually the entire time Homo sapiens have inhabited this planet, give or take 200,000 years, life was short, often brutally so. Most humans lived on average 20 to 25 years. About half of all children used to die within a year of being born, and about a third of all new mothers died during or shortly after childbirth. But then something extraordinary happened. Over the course of a single century, average life expectancies, they tripled. This occurred in less than a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. The pace of change varies from place to place, of course. In Japan, people live on average to 85, while in the Central African Republic, life expectancy is closer to 55. But this life extension, it's one of humanity's greatest, if unheralded, achievements. Changes in education, nutrition, and health throughout the 19th and 20th centuries they changed the game. Greater openness and connectivity have increased incomes and lengthened life expectancies. And maps can show it. In the 21st century, more people die of eating too much food than having too little. The point is that globalization, it's a super spreader of both goods and bads. And the conclusion is that the world doesn't need to end globalization. It needs much better globalization. Globalization has to become more inclusive and its negative externalities, they have to be mitigated. The story doesn't end here, of course. Notwithstanding enormous improvements across most measures of well-being, these same averages, they mask widening inequalities. Among the greatest threats we're facing right now is the short-termism of our governments, our companies, and our societies. We're all dramatically failing to address, even to apprehend the systemic risks and therefore mobilize the collective action needed to resolve them. We have to fix this state of affairs if future generations are to survive, much less thrive in our changing world. Ultimately, the best way to determine the future is to shape it. All of us, governments, businesses, and civil societies, we need to work together to address the intertwined threats that all of us are facing. This is gonna require new kinds of international cooperation, what some people call networked multilateralism, and a renewed commitment to data, to science, and to evidence. New perspectives that can help us navigate our increasingly complex and uncertain world, they can reveal much of our past, but they can also generate awareness of the present and ways all of us can build a better future. So faced with what seems and feels like an overwhelming impasse in our geopolitics, there's a real danger that we succumb to pessimism and paralysis, but this would be precisely the wrong thing to do. Maps a reminder that solutions are to be found not by retreating from our challenges, but by collaborating to overcome them. For centuries, Navigators have relied on a combination of methods, assessing the location of constellations and planets, observing the direction of wind, interpreting their compasses and sextants, and drawing on local wisdom to find their way to a final destination. Maps, they can give us safe passage, but we can't depend on them alone. What they can do is help tell the story of our changing world to make it terra cognita.